and welcome back to Up The Villa podcast. This is our tactical debrief for Aston Villa nil, Tottenham Hotspur 4. This episode is brought to you by SofaScore, the best football app going. You'll get live scores straight to your device quicker than any other app. But you've also got so many different stats, average positions, individual player data, right at your fingertips so you can watch the games, evaluate the games and have a real good summary while the games are going on and after the game. So you can scan the code that's on the screen. You can also click the link that's in the description to download SofaScore for free and it helps this channel out massively. So the debrief, do I want to do it? Not really. Do I want to dig any further into that that 4-0 pummeling from Spurs? No, but you know, we do it when we win. We do it when things are going good. So we've got to do it when it's not going so good either. So there's a lot to go through. But the main thing that I really want to talk about, we'll get towards that sort of towards the end of the episode, is John McGinn. So I really want to know from you guys in the comments section down below, are you worried now that John McGinn's out of the team for three games? He'll be playing in Europe, so that's OK. But Premier League, he's going to be out of that now. So for three games, we're going to miss John McGinn. So are you worried? Can we cope? And who comes in? That's what I want to know from you guys. So in the comment section down below, let me know what's going on there. So let's get into it then. We're going to we're gonna break it down because Unai gave us a new formation. So with that, we've got to have a look at it. We've got to have a look at how it how it performed, how it how it balanced the team was, did it work? I think you probably know my answer that it that it didn't work. Um, so we're going to go now to the tactical pad, and we're going to have a look at the tactical pad. And we're just going to have a look at this was Aston Villa's average positions in the first half. So first half, it was pretty even the game. Villa had more opportunities in the first half than Spurs, but there's a glaring area in the team that I've noticed from the first half from the passing network and from the average positions across the whole of the game. And I think some of you might be able to spot this area already. And it's this area. So why this area has worried me and, and has got me sort of thinking of where it possibly did go wrong for Aston Villa was the central area. There's not a Villa player in there. There's not a Villa player in that area for an, a, an average position that it's an area that a player has been in that position predominantly for the most of that half so average positions they basically tell the tale of the shape of the formation of the teams for so many times this season i've been able to say the average positions look like villa's formation that i would draw up on a piece of paper and I think that's a good telltale sign of, is the system working? Are we looking to have more control? And do we look at our tactical self? And for me, this would this would tell me no. But I could caveat that to say, in the first half, I felt like we were okay in this game. It was pretty, pretty even. Um, and we did have those chances on transition. But we know that we're not a transition team. And I think... When you look at how we set up against Spurs, why did we deviate from something that's done so well for us this season and has got us to fourth in the league? Did we give Spurs too much respect? And did we try and caveat their strengths by weakening our side? And I think we probably did. I think that's probably what happened. So if I have a look at the average, you know, the average position in the first half, some of the things that I liked about this in the first half was Ollie Watkins and I would say Leon Bailey. We spoke about how we can exploit Spurs in the match preview. We spoke about it all week. We know that Spurs leave two central defenders back, which are, which then would allow us to work with our front two. So I think that area was fine. But football at times is all about distances. Look at the distance between that front two and our midfield. The next player that's anywhere near our front two is Yuri Tielemans and and that gap and that that distance between McGinn, Louise, Watkins to Bailey it's too big 
It's far too big. We've also got Pau Torres and Luca Dean stepping on each other's toes. We've got only three players that are inside the Tottenham half. And, and that also shows that we are being pushed further backwards as well. So I really wanted to show you the average position, especially from the first half. Now, if I go and have a look at Aston Villa's average positions and the passing network over the course of the whole game, then it looks something like this. So we can see that Aston Villa's passing network, you know, there is that threat from a Douglas Louise to Ollie Watkins that's working. That that was a network that we looked to try and exploit. That happened, I think, two times, which, you know, that's what we were trying to do. So you can see what we were doing. But if I look at the actual Villa passing network now, and I'm looking at there's no network from Pau to Watkins, Pau to Tielemans, Pau to Leon Bailey. There's a lack of triangles, especially on that left-hand side. There's no network with Bailey and Watkins. So I just think there's no cohesion. It looked like a team that were a little bit lost and just couldn't get going. And I think a, a formation change is going to slightly bring that, isn't it? So I think now the next thing to note is that if we have a look at Spurs' passing network and, and an average position at the same time, there's one, well, there's one thing that's glaringly obvious for me, and that's Basuma and Madison's position. Now, I've showed you already that Aston Villa had nobody in that central area, but these two players were occupying that central area for Spurs, and I think that was so integral to the way they played. We saw Basuma dropping a little bit deeper, but he was playing in that pocket where there was no Villa player. So... I think Madison had that sort of free role license to move around as well. And we just we just struggled to get to grips with him because his movement and our distances were so far apart. To get anywhere near Madison, we, are, we were having to cover distance to get there. And then when we do get there, it was sort of a rash tackle or, you know, there's so many times where Madison was fouled and... And, you know, I've got to give credit to Spurs because I, I thought they were brilliant and they were, you know, they were a lot better than Villa. But I think some of the things that we did didn't really help. So, again, if I go back now and we have a little look at the average positions across the whole of the game, and you can really see here now in this area where I'm talking about this sort of circle zone here, Basuma's just chilling in there on his own. And then you've got Madison who was sort of pocketing and moving around through here. And we just really couldn't live with it. So I think this was a big problem for Aston Villa. And it's probably one of the reasons why we couldn't get any control. Um, and I think we, even though we went with the three at the back again, you've got Matty Cash's average positions. You know, if you're thinking of an out and out five at the back, we need to see more width from this area. And, and I just think we really, really struggled. So those are some of the things that, that I highlighted and I, and I wanted to show you guys of, of how I saw the positioning and, and, and everything that we were doing in this game as well. And so let's just have a look at some more of the stats then. So some of the stats from this game then. So we've got Aston Villa had 31% possession. Spurs had 69%. Aston Villa had 10 shots. Spurs had nine. We had one shot on target and they had five. If we go to some of the um, passing stats then. So Spurs made 708 passes, 91% passing accuracy. That is absolutely incredible numbers. That is fantastic. Villa, 303, 79%. So our passing accuracy was, was all off in this game, which is, you know, really, really frustrating. Second half, we had 31%. First half, we had 30%. So if we have a little closer look at the average positions then, and, and even on this graphic, you can see that hole, you can see that gap. But you can even see when you have a look at some of like the individual players on their heat maps, the, the fact that none of them are really getting into that central area. So McGinn stuck to that sort of right-hand side. Matty Cash, again, stuck to that 
that right hand side, but look at his heat map doing that defensive work. And I'm kind of thinking if you're meant to be the players that are either side, we we, we look disjointed with with Cash staying back and McGinn sort of staying into that backward area as well. We've got Bailey who's not really touched the ball too much either. So that's a big problem. If we look at Dougie Louise's average position again, look at the look at the D on the halfway line. It's, it's not that red. We look at Tielemans. I, I don't know whether those are goal kicks that he's getting that heat map from, but again, not really too central. So Villa really had a problem with, with dominating the middle of the park. And I think that's ultimately where it went wrong. We've got Luca Dean getting a little bit further forward. Pau in that sort of defensive area on that left-hand side. Conta on the right. Long lay central. Um, so, yeah, I think that midfield area was, was where that game was lost for Aston Villa. If we have a look at the Spurs' average positions now, you can see we've got Bissouma, the number eight. We've got Madison, 10. And we've also got Saar, number 29, who are quite central. Again, let's have a look at their heat map. So we've got Bissouma, Look at that for a heat map. He's absolutely everywhere. We've got Madison on that left. And then we've got Saar, who's going to be on that right-hand side. So their midfield three against our three won that battle. 100% won that battle. So that was a disappointing aspect from Villa. And then if we have a look at some of the some of the Spurs stats from the game and, and look at the passing numbers here, we've got We've got Madison, 94% passing accuracy, only won three of his 10 duels. We've got Basuma, 97% passing accuracy. We've got Saar, 83%. So big, big numbers with their passing accuracy. And then we go to Aston Villa's passing accuracy. We've got Dougie Louise, 87. Tielemann, 70. McGinn, 80. Watkins, 67. Digne, 71. Cash, 79. Long lane, 93. Big numbers from Long lane. Pau Torres, 86. Conza, 87. 88 for Conza. So when I'm looking at those numbers, you're really getting a tail of the game, a, a painted picture of what went wrong for Aston Villa. One other thing that has slightly worried me a little bit is that We've come up against some teams who have been pressing us a lot. Chelsea pressed us a lot. Newcastle pressed us a lot. Spurs pressed us a lot. And we've we've struggled in those games. Luton pressed us and we did deal with that press pretty well. Uh, but there is a little worrying thing in my head now about teams that are coming on to us and pressing us. And we are struggling when pressed. So... Bad day at the office. I think I'm going to summarise with, with bad day at the office on that aspect. A new formation, which I don't think worked. And I don't think it worked in a big game. I'd have liked to have seen us just stuck to what we know and play our way. Just exploit them in the way that we, we, we can exploit teams. Uh, but... There we go. That that's just who and I made that decision to change it. So, uh, so let's have a look at some of the still images now of the game, and I'll show you some of the other things that really disappointed me. And I'm sorry that I've got to show you disappointing aspects, but we've got to be realistic. You know, if if we play bad, we got to show it. If we play good, we got to show it. Um, so, one aspect of the game that I felt like we really struggled with was the give and go. The give and go. What is the give and go? It's literally you pass to a player, that player gets on their bike and then you receive that pass. Give, go, right? So we really struggled with this and we struggled with being able to read it and to be able to recover from it. So this was the first goal and this is in an area where I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, can we deal with this a bit better here? Can we, do we know, we know as a as a professional footballer that that pass is going to go there. He's, he's on his bike. So either somebody's got to come and get to there or 
this player has got to deal with it. Obviously, Cash has come across to, or somebody's come across, it must can't be Cash, it must be Tielemans. Somebody's come across to to deal with that, and, and we haven't. So that's a, a disappointing factor to start the move. Then once the move gets going, and that ball has now been played into Udoji, I think this must be Udoji, or it might be Saar. Again, one, two, three, four, five. Five Villa players completely out the game here. Five of them, like, deal with his better. Like, somehow read the pass or, or somebody track this, this player that's running into this area. And it was it was a fantastic delivery. It, it was it was unbelievable delivery in this area. It was a world class delivery. You know, this isn't just a cross into the box. This is with conviction. It's it's pure quality and Madison again gets in between the two can we cut that cross out in this area? But I don't know whether we've just got to give credit to the ball that's gone in that's absolutely amazing. But, you know, you can't really pinpoint blame on, on one of these two defenders because we defend as a team. So that ball has travelled from a long way. We've gone from this area of having, not that area actually, from this area of having three players around the ball to having five players beyond around the ball to then that ball going into the box and disappointing. Now, this one summarised Aston Villa in a way because it really highlights what I've been talking about of, of the midfield, of nobody being in that midfield area. So we've got Douglas Louise in a deep line position. We've got McGinn on that sort of right-hand side. And then in the middle... Absolutely nobody. So when I've been talking about Madison getting in, in, in shape, we've got Papa Saar getting in shape, we've got Basuma in that midfield area as well. There's nobody in midfield Aston Villa. So we've Konza has had to play this really bad ball to Tienemans, who's under pressure, who's being swamped. And it's a terrible ball in a terrible area. But again, I look at this area and I'm like, where, where, where's the midfield players? You know, I, I just don't understand why there was no Villa midfielder in that area. Um, and we know in football that if you win the midfield battle, that midfield battle is so important. But, you know, that epitomised, kind of epitomised the shape of the team and the poor pass epitomised the bad decision making we made in this game. And then I spoke about Zaniolo in the match reaction and the player ratings are, are on this role. And again, go back to the first goal. We've got into an area. Can we deal with it? Can we deal with this area here? You know, if I'm looking at Zaniolo taking up a position now, I'm thinking you've got to make sure you either go around there to block off this player on this run. Because you can see the player, that you can see what's going to happen. He's going to get into that area. So we've got to make sure we, we cover this, this pass and we simply don't. And the disappointing aspect of it is that when the ball goes to this player, look at our reaction. <sighs> like, it's really bad to see. Really bad to see. Moreno's disappointed because Moreno's disappointed because he's trying to win that ball there. He's he's trying to stop that ball. So he's disappointed. But get on your bike and recover. Zaniolo, get on your bike and recover and help out and try and and try and get back. You know, Zaniolo in this instance has took up a position where he's just watching. He's just watching. Moreno make a tackle and he's got no drive to get back and help support the team. And this is why I was so disappointed with Zaniolo because where's the help? And then we just exposed with three central players who are then in sort of 
recover have got to recover but also they're in sort of no man's land because if you allow somebody of quality to pick up the ball and get a ball into the box or pick a man of this quality then you're asking for trouble like we saw with the first goal so this type of defending here is just something that I don't like I don't like I don't like giving up and it just looked to me like we just give up and that's so disappointing and for somebody who's so passionate about this team to see that and to see that in real time I was I was really disappointed Villa fans I'm not going to lie I'm not going to you know I'm not going to hammer players for no reason but when I'm seeing stuff like this I can understand quality I can understand if if somebody's better than somebody else, I can hold my hands up and say, you know what? Spurs were way better than Villa in this game. But don't do stuff like this. Don't don't give up. Don't give up. And, and that's something that I really did not like to see. So, yeah, I've just got to highlight it because I don't like it. And there we go. And then we got into another area of just absolute disaster. I mean... <laughs> Pick your pass. Pick your pass and score. And then finally, you know, another one. Cut inside, drag back and, and a, a finish from Timo Werner. And it's 4-0. So, yeah, you know, it's it's been a, obviously a, a difficult episode to break down. But I think, you know, we've got to, we've got to break it down. We've got to show where we went wrong. We've got to show what was bad. We've got to show where we can regroup and recover and, and what we can do to to get better and and to sort of adapt and, and now focus on focus on us. So we're gonna now at the end of the show now we're gonna have a look at this McGinn Quinnan what is it conundrum is that the word uh, that we're in the, the predicament that we're in so I think we can all admit that we won't be playing this formation again. I think we can all probably say, five at the back now, done and dusted. Don't do it again, right? So, if we have a look at the team now, what are we going to do without McGinn? So, hopefully you guys at home have put your comments in there and your thoughts on what you think we're going to do. Um, so, maybe I'll be reiterating some of your thoughts. What do we do? Now, with Kamara out, we've still got some options. There are some options still in there um, of what we can do. So against Ajax, I imagine, well, again, against Ajax, maybe we're going to have to do something a bit different here because to bring somebody in who's going to be able to play in this. So if I was to put my general formation of what I possibly think we could see against West Ham. So West Ham, think about West Ham, a game in front, we've got to take you out. So we've kind of got two positions to fill, really, of, of, of how I think we can go about this. The easy option, and I think the option which we, we're getting towards, is that Timmy Raboonen plays. So Timmy Raboonen comes in, and that then allows maybe Bailey to go out wide, Tielemans to go up top. And then if Ramsey's fit or Rogers, we don't know. Ramsey didn't make the bench. He might be able to make the bench against Ajax. Come on, get some minutes against West Ham. So we could go Ramsey. So we could possibly go for something like this. So we'd have the three at the back with Konsa, Long, Lai Pau, Digne going forward. Double pivot of Iribunum and Louise. Ramsey on that left-hand side. Tielemans pressing with Watkins and then Bailey out wide. I think that is the best option. This didn't work against Spurs with Bailey up top. Bailey needs to be here, I think. And then Tielemans can play that role. Now, the other option you've got is putting Tielemans in there. And then Irabunan doesn't play. And then you go in with a, a, a Diaby with, you know, Diaby supporting 
in that role there. And then we could bring in Ramsey on that left-hand side or Rogers, whoever it has to be. And then it looks more like that. That allows Tielemans to play, but I don't think Tielemans is good in there. I think I'm starting to quickly realise that Tielemans' his best position is when he's partnering Ollie Watkins up there. He's dropping into there and he's working into that area. Over there, I don't think it's working. So for me, that's how Tielemans plays. And I think that's the only the only two options we got. It's it's either Tielemans or Irabunam. And I think I'm edging towards Irabunam because we can't weaken the team further forward by playing somebody else that's going to be in a position that's just not their own, if that makes sense. So I think Ramsey's massive to Villa coming back now in this running because we need his legs, we need his energy, we need his dribbling ability. So for me, I think I'm going with Irabunam. And I felt like when he came on Irabunam, he looked pretty he looked pretty decent um against Spurs. He 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 kind of had some some bright sparks really. Um uh, especially when he came out from the back. He won four he won three of his four duels and he had 100 percent passing accuracy. So that that was a, a decent 20 minute performance from him, really. You know, he won his duels, he had good passing accuracy. Um so yeah, so that's where I'm at. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed the show, even though it's been probably eye-opening to how poor we were. Let me know what you think of the camera quality. We've got a new camera. So the new camera I've used as the webcam, and I think it's better quality than the old one. So if you notice the difference with the camera quality, let me know, um, and we can... We'll keep using it. I think we will keep using it anyway. So just want to say cheers, everybody, for all of your support. You are all absolute legends. You have been supporting the channel. Um, you're absolutely all doing amazing. So cheers for all of the love on the channel. We'll be back for a Ajax match preview and we'll start all of our Ajax content. And yeah, cheers, everyone, for watching up the villa.